All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome if you're new to this room uh, or welcome back if you're not. Uh, so next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Shell Gentleman. Uh, Dr. Shell Gentleman is a senior scientist at the Fa uh, Farallon Institute. As a computational physical oceanographer focused on remote sensing, she has worked for over 25 years to better understand how the oceans impact our lives. She was co-chair of the National Academy for Science, Sciences and Engineering Committee of Best Practices for a Future Open Code Policy for NASA Space Sciences, sciences and is really good at using obscure government acronyms instead of actual words to communicate. Uh, really excited to, to hear about um, open science and uh, yeah, take it away, take it away, Shell. Great, uh, thanks so much, Rob. I'm really excited to be at my first FOSS4G. Uh, so thank you everyone. Uh, I'm Michelle Gunneman and I'm going to try to figure out the chat and send out links to my talk afterwards. Otherwise, I'll definitely send them out over Twitter. Uh, I really want to emphasize that we are all facing a climate crisis. And it was well predicted, it was well documented, and we really still lack the solutions that we need. The sit tight and then assess response has failed us and we need to find new solutions fast. We need to move science faster. And that means that science has to partner with the free and open source software to advance science faster and better. And right now, science really stands at the cusp of these advances in data and software and computing that are enabling this chance for formational interdisciplinary science. And they're changing what type of questions we can ask. We really need to be a mosaic of voices in the discussion. And we have to work together and we have to work better. And I was asked to focus on two questions, what sort of open data and tech is available now that can be applied to these use cases? And, and what, what are we building for the future? And so to do that, I thought it might be helpful to give you all an idea for where science is at and where it needs to be. Because honestly, I, there's a little bit of a disconnect sometimes. And I experienced this at my first Python class a few years ago where people actually like thought I was trying to make a joke when I said that I programmed in Fortran. And so what does research really look like for a lot of scientists right now? And how is open source software and open source science going to change everything? So right now we need data. And if you have the bandwidth and storage to do so, you can download the data. Uh, you bring it to your local system and large data like the CMIP6 climate models those can take months to download. It's like 900 terabytes right now. So good luck. Um, usually you just download part of it and hope it's what you wanted. If there's a new version and CMIP 6 comes out, download it again. And that's predicted to be an exabyte. So again, uh, that approach seems to be a bit broken right now. This means that locally you have to store and maintain the data set. And maybe people at your institution can use it but really nobody else can. And that reinforces institutional advantages and it silos your work. Big agencies, big institutions, they can afford to maintain these really big on-prem data stores. And that's great for them. But like, what about the rest of us? What about the rest of the world where science is being done and the much larger community outside of these exclusive clubs? Creating analysis ready, cloud optimized, like ARCO versions of these data with clean data provenance it, it really breaks up this club and it opens up data for anyone to use. So for many years, I worked on developing geophysical retrieval algorithms for satellite data. And most satellites carry several instruments. Each instrument usually measures a few geophysical parameters like ocean temperature or wind speed or precipitation and so on. For ocean temperature, for a single instrument, I knew of 10 independent efforts to produce the same measurement of ocean temperature from the same data. And now multiple efforts are good because everyone catches a different problem, but 80% of the code development was really identical. It wasn't shared and that redundant, it meant that algorithms advanced more slowly than if the code base had been shared and advancements were done collectively. Errors in competitor algorithms were sort of celebrated rather than acknowledging that part of the reason they existed was a lack of sharing and strained resources. And this development path impedes advancement, is difficult to share, and it reinforces closed science. It's one of the most inefficient, 
hurtful parts of science and it really has to change. Instead of agencies funding four groups at 250K per year to do this work, we need to take a page from the free and open source software movement and fund one group at 250K to build the project and then use the rest, the 750K to fund innovative work. And scientists now mostly run analysis on local cyber infrastructures with compiler-specific operating systems and unique environments with unique closed code. And this makes it really hard to work with anyone else. And that, again, reinforces institutional advantages. Only a small percentage of scientists at the top institutions have access to this excellent cyber infrastructure. And universities and agencies have struggled to hire in this area because they can't pay enough. It always takes a few months to learn your way around this new infrastructure, and this is just time that's lost. And more importantly, because of security concerns, it is really difficult for outsiders to gain access, and that makes it hard to share software, to share data, to share moving forward in science. And moving to the cloud opens up participation in science, and it opens up possibilities for collaborations at a much bigger scale using much bigger data than we even thought possible just a few years ago. So why are also so many research articles look but don't touch? You can see the abstract, but the full article is behind a paywall. And this restricts access to knowledge. It perpetuates exclusionary practices. And again, it reinforces these institutional advantages since they've often negotiated discounts for publishing and access to those journals. You know, at this point, you may sense a theme. It almost seems like science was designed to exclude, and there's almost a playbook. It, it was designed to protect funding. And the best way they thought to do that was to silo information. And then after building this fortress and then reinforcing the walls against intruders, science organizations wonder why diversity is an issue. I mean, research results should be published with open access, and this has to be allowed for and budgeted at the proposal stage and recognizing that there also needs to be a path for publishing open access articles for everyone, regardless of funding. So in the last couple of years, this is where you all have come in. The steady advancement of open source technologies have removed many of the barriers to collaboration. And this isn't a sudden breakthrough. It's instead the result of steady, consistent open source developers addressing the needs of the community. And if there was a security issue, they didn't find a different proprietary solution. They fixed the library so that everyone can benefit. And teamwork is key to the success of open science. And we all have to participate at every level in order to realize the benefits. Open source science projects have more connections. They include more people, which amplifies their impact. And that's what we want, right? It's been demonstrated by research, and it's also my direct experience that open projects build more connections to solve better problems. Everyone plays to their area of expertise, and the end results are stronger and better. And right now, we really, really need that. So this figure illustrates how my workflow as an oceanographer has changed in large part due to advances in technology, software, and data. Through a web browser running on any internet connected device, I can authenticate myself, access a coding environment populated with my favorite open source software libraries, and this connects me to a massive server farm adjacent to petabytes of data. I access hubs anywhere equally as easily. And I'm mostly running the Pangeo software stack, which is pretty similar to what's on the planetary computer. It's a collection of software libraries for earth science. And I think of a question and a few minutes later, I'm exploring data, finding answers, and the pace of my science isn't just faster, it's better. It's in a completely different class. And this means I can ask more questions and do it in an environment where I have this community of people to discuss and solve roadblocks and barriers. And the most remarkable part of this is like I said, I'm just an oceanographer. I mean, I know my way around computers from all the coding I've done, but I'm not an expert. And the details of this are really like another language and I don't understand a lot of it, but these recent advances mean that I access it on my terms and I don't need to know the details. I can just focus on my science. So now I'm gonna go through a couple of these core tools and how they're changing and where we need further development. So there's probably some version of this line at every organization that I've been at. We're all looking at the data volumes and saying, wait, 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 hold on. There's an arrow that points to where we are now and then where it's going to be in a few years. And we really need to change how we're handling the data. And I'm going to argue, like, 
we're the now is much further to the right. We're already at a point where we can't download the data. We need these new tools, this new way of accessing data. And many US agencies are moving onto the cloud. They make it easier to quickly collaborate, make it easier to reproduce and extend results. And access is not bandwidth limited, so more people can do science. Data aren't siloed into domain-specific archives. I can access 40 years of global winds just as easy as 40 years of Landsat imagery. And this encourages more interdisciplinary research and helps us understand how our environment affects our health. And all this broadens who can participate in science. And another step is that data is being put into analysis ready formats, such as ZAR and GeoTIFF and Parquet. And in some of the benchmark testing, it's like 99% faster. And I can just visualize and start working with these 8, 16 terabyte data sets in a couple lines of code. Satellites have collected vast amounts of data over the past 50 years. And accessing this data up until this point has been mostly restricted to a few privileged institutions or scientists who have training in the data formats to access it. This needs to be made more accessible by being put onto the cloud. And this will help scientists move towards more reproducible science. There's so much innovation happening right now, both in cloud optimized formats, but also in creating the metadata from older formats so that without transforming the data set, we can still access it in a cloud optimized format. And more and more what I see is this like Wizard of Oz curtain actually working that as a scientist, I want to know where the data is. I want to know the details and certainty estimates, what it is, how I can use it. But I don't need to know the format or the chunking size or the compression methods. And that is becoming more and more invisible to me. And we need to lean into that so that more people with different backgrounds who haven't developed bit flags or metadata standards can understand and use the data easily. Scientists shouldn't have to care whether it's in GeoTIFF or NetCDF or FITS or ASCII. And this is sort of my first ask to this community is building more in this area is going to help us as scientists extend to new science ideas, new breakthroughs, and set up for future innovations that we need. And my second point around data is this, these innovations are happening from developers here. There was not a big federal program to develop ZAR. It was started less than six years ago by a malaria researcher. And do you know how many employees at big federal agencies have been working to make data accessible? We need them here. And for the future, we need to build more bridges between these communities, the big agencies holding the data. And somehow we need to work with them to pivot away from the not invented here mentality to contribute and build with others model. And that's going to be a challenge. So how do we work to develop communities that, incur that include the government data people? So we're going to talk about software, open software that's permissively licensed, public on GitHub with a community that builds and supports it. This way of building software has changed how software is built and it's changed how companies train new employees. These collaborative tools are more robust and interdisciplinary and they fuel this explosion of AIML. And why AIML may be the most visible example, across most of our disciplines, there are advanced open source software tools that is making, are making science more accessible. And there's no doubt that this speeds up science. And scientists are starting to take notice but switching from a 100% closed siloed development and the funding security that goes along with that is not a great value proposition for them right now. We need more scientists to see how much of this software is being used in the coolest research. And a few years ago, there was a Science Magazine article that featured some of my research, but it wasn't cited. I was pretty sure it was mine because it was the image that was the cover image for my article. So I just emailed them and I grazed the correct citation and, you know, everyone makes mistakes. But within like two hours, they had updated it online and I was cited. And I'm telling this story because I think this is really important for this community. We need to make it really easy to cite your software, create releases and get DOIs from Zenodo. And if you see something, say something. We need more publications to properly credit software. Since I'm here talking to all you, I'm going to ask you to advocate for yourselves by making sure that you get proper credit. It's really hard for to me to go to scientists and show them the transformative impact of open source software when I probably estimate 90% of the research isn't giving credit to the open source, the credit it deserves. So please be your own advocate. And GitHub just made it easier to include a citation file in your repo. So 
do this. And let's continue to make it easier to credit software and to cite it in publications. And this is another idea where development could help. I'd love to have something like the NB Viewer, where I can look at my Jupyter Notebook that I can just open in my project environment and point to uh, an import statement and point to a notebook with a Python file and have it look at the import statements and give me back a list of citations for my publication. Like there's things that we can do to make it easier to cite. And if we do this, more people will cite and then we'll build more community. And then it's this great positive feedback loop. So the data, the software, the compute, they all come together on these cloud-based infrastructure science data platforms. And they're this interface that provides user access to a coding environment. And whether it's on-prem, on cloud, on HPC, you know, we want it to look the same no matter where it is. And that means that scientists, as they move around, there isn't a need to retrain. And this has mostly been developed by the open science community and Jupyter hubs are becoming the default tool. And it looks the same no matter where it's located, pretty much. You just have to access to different resources and libraries. And I think this is really exciting because how scientists get on the cloud is an area that's evolving rapidly. Sometimes we're logging onto a cloud with a Docker image of an environment. Sometimes we're bursting onto the cloud from our local environment. And the core of this really is a lot of it is Jupiter, at least for scientists. And I see federal agencies, commercial cloud institutions and individuals building out their research infrastructure with Jupiter. And if we wanna have more scientific use, we need to really continue to develop its usability and maintain it. And the way to advance science faster to make it seamless to work on anywhere or system. And that's sort of the core technology. And the more that we can all support and build with Jupiter, I think the faster it will make science and the more people will participate. These platforms are an area that I also think more needs more development is how to enable more interactions between developers and scientists. I'm part of the Pangeo project. And one of the reasons I think it was really successful was because they enabled this. And so how do we expand that? There have been some high profile AI ML failures recently where it was specifically found that groups weren't doing interdisciplinary work. They had scientists like me who know the physics and the data trying to use advanced AI ML models and failing. And AI ML experts were trying to use data they didn't know and they were failing. And we need these two groups to work together. And I'm really curious to hear ideas from this community about how we can enable those sort of collaborations. And do we have like a developer in residence in science departments? And do we have a scientist in residence and computer scientist departments? Or do we reimagine what institutions or what communities look like to create more different agile groups and this supportive relationship? You know, these platforms are sort of the start for doing this broad participation. And what we get with this, which is incredible, and this is really about broadening participation and who can be part of these groups, is we get a supercomputer behind every device and a $36 computer. This is my kid's Raspberry Pi on the left, can run 80 workers and you know several hundred gigabytes of data. And it can be run on a cell phone or a laptop or a Raspberry Pi. And anyone can do science anywhere on any device. And intermittent power or low bandwidth are no longer an impediment and more people are gonna participate when they're hired to work or when they produce results that are useful, they're already working in an environment that's familiar and easy. And this is really powerful when you think about bringing science to the world and allow people who have local knowledge to use the data. It's really amazing that we have this sort of capability and we need to make sure that there are many pathways to doing science and many pathways to access compute and data because this empowers everyone, not just the privileged few. We have to be very careful about that, I think. And from a scientist's perspective, you know, setting up a Kubernetes cluster, it's all behind the curtain, these barriers are removed, but provisioning blob storage, like, okay, for me, it still remains a challenge. And there's other challenges that can be addressed. So I encourage us all to continue to work to remove these barriers because there's still lots of parts that aren't figured out. And so I'm gonna just sort of summarize some of my asks, like what do we do about the data? Uh, transform it to COG and upload it, invest in software solutions to minimize old format issues. How do we advance search engines to enable interdisciplinary work and lower barriers to science? How do we build bridges between the free and open community and data archives? 
What do we do about software? How can we support open source development? Can everyone make sure that they have a citation file in their GitHub repo and ensure that software cited in scientific publications and develop tools that make it easier to do that? And what about cloud computing? The space is evolving fast and we don't really want an agency solution fostered on a bunch of scientists that tends not to work out well. And importantly, how do we ensure that the institutional silos that we just escaped aren't recreated by limiting access to cloud computing to only wealthy countries? How do we use these platforms to really start working efficiently in cross-disciplinary teams, including people from around the world? Free and open source software is enabling transformational science, but we still have a ways to go. And so we need to build these bridges between the free and open source software community and science and the federal agencies that fund the science. And I wanna announce here, I'll send some links out in the chat, but NASA just announced funding for several open source software libraries through their open source science initiative. And there's gonna be a number of new announcements about NASA initiatives at this October 14th workshop. And the head of science at NASA, Dr. Zubukin, will be giving the intro. And NASA's Chief Data Officer, Kevin Murphy, will be there. And the Open Source Science Program Officer will be there, Steve Crawford. And they're going to talk about future plans and future directions. And in the full agenda, there's actually like breakout rooms you can go to to meet these people. And this is a really great place to go and meet and discuss with NASA, like a big federal agency that has a lot of power. And I really encourage you to attend and let your opinion be heard. I'll chat out this link. Um, you just pre-register, it's free. And I wanna thank everyone for making this possible. It's really exciting time to be doing science for me. And I really wanna thank all of you for the open source software that I'm using to do it. And I'll be around for Q&A. Thank you. One of the things that I miss uh, with the virtual conference is the roaring applause after uh, a, a great talk. So I'll just aggressively snap. Uh, really inspirational stuff. Uh, you know, it's your first Phosphor G, but you're speaking about uh, open source software for geospatial with the best of them. So please, please do stick around. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a big and with, fan. <laughs> and with that, I'll uh, try to bring up some questions. I think you can kind of pop them on the the channel. Anyway, um, so first question is. Uh, are Python and Jupyter Notebooks becoming a standard for code publication and open science initiatives? In my community, yes. I would say R and R Markdown are also very popular. But uh, so I would say that there's more people are starting to use Python. There's still a big R community. But the community that's using these within science is probably I would say 10 to 15 percent and you know that that percentage is larger with the younger community and then it goes to probably vanishingly small to scientists you know my age and older it's getting even on github you know even just sharing fortran on github is something that most scientists aren't comfortable doing so I like that's why we need bridges to this community because most scientists just fundamentally don't aren't familiar with working in a community like this. Thank you. And uh, one big problem with open science is the variety of data types, sensors, quality, resolutions, etc. How can we manage and integrate such uh, kind of different information? Are there any strategies to cope with those issues? I think that's where sort of there was this really powerful article that came out in the tech review, uh, maybe in June, it was a couple of months ago, and it was about, you know, everyone tried to develop COVID diagnostic tools and they all failed. And it was it like sort of reviewed hundreds of tools that were developed. And it points to exactly what you just mentioned, which is data is very, very complex to use. And if you have people who know the AIML models just taking data, you know, what ended up happening with these AI, with these COVID diagnostic tools, one of them learned how to develop the, it learned to identify the font on one of the scans rather than actually looking at the scans. Another uh, model learned how to, basically it was great at identifying children because they, it was given positive COVID scans of children and the adults were all negative. So like, 
No, working with, this is where we really have to learn how to work with each other. You need people who can just look at that data and they, they've worked with it for 10 years and they know all of what's wrong and what's right. All of those things that are sort of try to communicate with uncertainty and metadata, but often aren't communicated. So teaming with scientists who know the data and developers who know the software is I think the path forward. Awesome, awesome answer. Uh, another question from the audience is um, IEEE, IEEE, is developing an interesting open source, uh, open science platform named Explorer, where you can interact directly on data and codes published in a science paper. Are you following the same conceptual way of developing open science, or are you developing your own conceptual framework? Um, so I know that I'm not sure I quite understand the question. I know that there's a lot of publishers, AGU, IEEE, who are developing the ability to you know, publish Jupyter Notebooks and publish your software along with the publication, and that there's ways to do this interactively using Binder or other platforms. There's a lot of platform development. Every time I feel like I turn around, you know, ESA has funded a platform for accessing their code, or there's, there's so many different platforms that people are developing. And so often it seems to be this model again of, I am going to develop something new from scratch and maybe I'll take some open source tools and not really give them a lot of credit or contribute back, but I'm just gonna build something for IEEE or something for NASA or something for NOAA. And we really have to, we have to just break that model. The model needs to be what have other people built that I can contribute to and build on that will be applicable to my problem. Awesome. And then there's just a request to um, uh, maybe post some of your most liked science tools in the chat. There's an ID department uh, person here wanting to impress his scientists uh, with ultra fancy tools. Yeah, I think you just got to go to Pan so Pangeo.io. I'll put out in the chat. And uh, it's the same essential software stack that the planetary computer is running. And there's a, you can look at all the tools to replicate, but you know, like X-Ray and Dask and SciPy, I just have so much love. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, and I'll just uh, sort of uh, comment on, on some of the struck me. There, there's a specific ask in this talk, which is figure out how to get a DOI mm -hmm. into your software. And that's something that I personally have not thought about at all. Um, in in source software that I that I work with, and um, I'm now uh, gonna try to figure figure that out. I think uh, to, to do that. And you go to Odo and create an account, and you just you um, authorize GitHub, and there's like a. Really